Today is a blessed day, and it is good for us to be gathered in this place of peace, to hear God's word and to ourselves enter into the enactment of this ritual. Liturgy, liturgos, is the work of the people. So it is good for us to embody the gospel in the way that we do, particularly on this Sunday. There's a place in the gospels where it says that Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem. And it's a pivotal moment in his ministry. He's been everywhere in his world. He's been down into the southern reaches of Judah. He's been up throughout all of the old northern kingdom of Israel. He's been throughout the Galilee. He's even been to Samaria. He's been down in the region of the Philistines along the Gaza coast. He's been up in the region of the Baal-worshipping Syrophoenicians up along the northern coast of the Mediterranean as it comes along. He's been east of the Jordan. He's been to the Decapolis, the region of the Gentiles. And conspicuous in his travels and ministry is the fact that he has never been to the center of that world to bring his ministry and his proclamation to Jerusalem. And this he does now. And at that pivotal point in the Gospels, Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem. And we hear echoing the words of the prophet Isaiah, Jesus' favorite prophet, quotes him more than any other prophet, any other scripture from the Hebrew Testament. Isaiah is his go-to. I have set my face like flint. And I will not be put to shame. Stand with me. Who will contend with us? For it is God that saves us. We hear this echoing from the prophecy of Isaiah, the song of the suffering servant. And now this servant king sets his sights on Jerusalem. And he picks an auspicious time to come. It's Passover. This is one of the high festival days when all Jews are called to return to Jerusalem to celebrate and make sacrifice in the temple. One of three times a year that they're called to do this. And Jesus is a practicing Jew. And he and his followers come to Jerusalem as well, as the tradition of the people holds. And everyone who's anyone is there. The Sadducees are there. The leaders of the temple, the chief priests, there are two in his time. And all of the priestly apparatus, all of the priests and teachers of the law, the scribes and elders are in Jerusalem for this great celebration, the Passover festival, commemorating God, bringing the people out of captivity and into a place of God's provision. And the Pharisees are there, this kind of grassroots, populist, purist reform movement, with whom Jesus has contended in virtually every other place that he's gone. They're all there. And the Herodians, Herod Antipas and this puppet government that is in place over the people to help ensure order and productivity on behalf of Rome, who's there in force today as well. Pontius Pilate has come up from his seacoast palace, Caesarea Maritima, And he's made his way into Jerusalem as well. And the Roman cohort cohort from the fortress Antonia has turned out because these Jews are trouble. They are a fractious people and anything can set them off and maybe touch off the violent rebellion that everybody seems to fear. Everybody who's anybody is in Jerusalem today and they've come in, the more auspicious their entrance the more honor, the more opulent, the more regal and authoritative it would seem. If you can come in on a war horse, that's pretty good. Camel, exotic. If you can come in on an elephant, all the better. And here comes Jesus on a donkey. And we've talked before in the past about the 
the kind of pageantry, the kind of political theater of this, the deliberate display. And it's an intentional display, isn't it? He does this very intentionally. We hear it in our gospel reading today. There's a couple that he tells, go to the village ahead of us. There's going to be a donkey there. I want you to get it and bring it back here. And if anybody asks you what you're doing, just tell them I have need of it and we'll bring it back when we're done. This they do. And then they spread their cloaks on it and he begins to ride in. And people are cutting branches in the fields and they're coming up and laying those on the path and they're waving them just as we did today. And here again, we hear a prophetic echo. We hear the prophecy of Zion, of Zechariah. Rejoice, rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, your Savior comes to you humble and mounted on a colt and a, on a donkey and a colt, the foal of a donkey. Right straight out of prophecy. He is enacting what the prophets have foretold on his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And the people are mad. The people are singing and praising, singing the psalm, the processional psalm of David, 118, just as we have just done. Hosanna, Hosanna, Lord save us, it translates. Hosanna, Hosanna, Lord save us. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the son of David. Because that echoes in their heads and hearts the tradition of David, the warrior king, who unites this disparate confederation of tribes, this loose gathering of people, enough that they can defeat their enemies and live freely in the land God has given them. This is the tradition. This is what's being enacted this day. But they hear the echoes of another more recent episode in their history as well. They hear of the time when it's not the Philistines. See people that David is conquering. They hear of a time when somebody from their own tradition, Judas Maccabeus, Judas the hammer, defeats the Greeks. Because in between the Testaments, we have Alexander the Great and all that Greek stuff. You remember that? In between there, the Greeks rule this land and these people. They are the oppressor of the day, and there was a time in their history when Judas Maccabeus and his brothers rose up against their Greek oppressors and beat them, defeated them militarily, and the people experienced a time of freedom. Sadly, not of peace, but a time of freedom. And when Judas and his Soldiers returned to Jerusalem from having defeated the Greeks at the Battle of Emmaus. They make a triumphal entry into the city and the people throw their cloaks on the street before them and they cut branches and wave them and they sing the processional psalm of David. Greeting the conquering hero, the one God has raised up to make them free. Sound familiar? And today this echoes and is enacted in the midst of the people. And the people know this story. They are longing for this. They are looking for the one God will raise up to lead them against the oppressor of the day, which is now Rome, to throw off the yoke and the power of earthly empire so that they may be free once more. And here comes this one. And they sing and they praise and this is exactly what everybody's afraid of, getting this mob riled up. And I know I'm dating myself, but do you remember from Jesus Christ Superstar? Do you remember Jesus Christ Superstar? Good. The place where Caiaphas, one of the high priests, comes to Jesus and says, tell this rabble to be quiet. We anticipate a riot. This common crowd is much too loud. Tell this mob that sings your song that they are fools and they are wrong. They are a curse. They must disperse. Remember that? You remember what Jesus says? Why waste your breath moaning at the crowd? Nothing could be done to stop this shouting. If every tongue was still, the noise would still continue. The rocks and stones themselves would start to sing. Amen? This is what everybody's afraid of. The people latching on 
to a charismatic leader who then marshals their efforts and resources and leads them in a rebellion against Rome. Everybody's afraid of this. The Jewish leadership is afraid of this. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Herodians fear this as much as anyone, and Rome just doesn't want to be bothered with having to crush mercilessly another rebellion. So tell them to be quiet, but they will not. And Jesus comes into the city and makes a fuss. The first thing that Judas Maccabeus does when he comes into Jerusalem, after it's been occupied by the Greeks, is to go straight to the temple and purify it. He tears out the things that have accompanied Greek worship in the temple. The statue of Antiochus Epiphanes on the temple platform. He purges and purifies the temple and reconsecrates it for Jewish worship once again, the celebration of Hanukkah. And the first thing that Jesus does when he comes to Jerusalem is to go straight to the temple and start turning over the table of the money changers who are there charging usurious fees for the conversion of money to temple coin for people to pay their taxes and their free will offerings and their tithes. And the usurious practice of the sale of sacrificial animals, he drives them out of the temple courts. He turns over the tables of the money changers. He purifies and reconsecrates the temple, saying, my father's intention was this was to be a house of prayer for the nations. You've made it a den of robbers away. This crowd, this crowd that sings and glorifies in him and has such a resurgence of hope on his entry in, will in a very few short days reject him entirely. He's come to Jerusalem to do the same thing that he's been doing all over the rest of this world, proclaiming not a kingdom of the Jews, but the kingdom of God. Not a violent overthrow of an oppressive regime, but a way of peace and truth that leads to life where we are called to pray for our enemies and be in ministry with those who persecute us. This isn't what they expected at all. This isn't a warrior king like David. This isn't someone who's going to set us free like Judas the hammer. This isn't the guy we were looking for at all. This guy comes proclaiming peace. Comes proclaiming a God that was not going to lead us into battle, but a God that transcends violence and conquers through the power of love and compassion and forgiveness. And in that short time, they will reject him entirely. And one among this crowd, one who had the highest hopes and aspirations for this one, perhaps of all, named after the hammer himself, Judas, is among this crowd as well. And in the failed hopes and ambitions that he has for this leader, this reluctant Messiah, will turn on him entirely by the end of the week. And the crowd will shout again and cheer once more for a leader. Barabbas, we call him. Bar Abbas, son of the father. A zealot in jail for murdering Romans. And they will cast aside Jesus to the devices of Rome that Rome has for dealing with people who would pretend to be a king in their empire. From the glory of this day to the depths of Good Friday in less than a week. 
But Jesus sets his face like flint, as the prophet says. And he goes and does exactly as God has called him to do, regardless of the consequences. Refusing to be backed down. Who will contend with us? Who will stand against us? Armed as we are with the truth of God. Instead, as Paul observes about him today, he doesn't regard equality with God as something to be grasped, something to be held onto, but in the great kenosis, it's called the emptying. Empties himself of all of that. Empties himself of this sense of his own godliness. Empties himself of his own humanity. Empties himself of his own ego, his own designs and desires. And comes simply to proclaim the truth of God's kingdom in the midst of what has become increasingly a godless world. And he will not back up a step. So as we sing and wave our palm branches today, and as we enact this liturgos, this work of the people, which Messiah are we looking for? One who will deal with our enemies and vanquish those who persecute us, and there are many or one who will steadfastly teach us a way of love that transcends violence and oppression. Amen.